You are on Strat News Global, and I am Nitin Gokhale. Strategic Insight is a program that Strat News Global does in association with USI, India's oldest military think tank. Today, we are going to discuss the possibility of the two-front war or a two-front scenario against India. For years, strategic planners, military leadership has been discussing the possibility of a nexus between China and Pakistan. Is that for real now? That's what we'll discuss in this episode of Strategic Insight. So to discuss this subject, I am joined by two distinguished uh, military officers uh, who in their career have dealt with this subject extensively. To my left, uh, Major General B.K. Sharma, uh, the director of USI, a familiar face on Strategic Insight, uh, as you have already seen him in a couple of programs earlier. And to my right, Lieutenant General G.S. Katoch, who is the head of the editorial team of USI and uh, also the council member of uh, the think tank. Welcome both of you and uh, let me turn to you, General Sharma. Uh, what are the key factors in uh, the possible nexus uh, of a two-front scenario against India by China and Pakistan, if you can elucidate a little bit. See, we have to first uh, analyze the depth of this relationship. And I would like to put it in a strategic context that right from the beginning, Pakistan has been a linchpin in China's South Asia strategy. Even though Pakistan was flirting with the United States of America, be it Sento, Seto, but their relationship with Pakistan remained even on an even keel. Be it that Karakram Highway, uh, subsequently uh, you had the Comprehensive Nuclear Agreement in uh, 1986. Then in 2003, they signed the Free Trade Agreement. 2005, they had that Friendship Treaty. And 2015, you had the mother of all the agreements, that is uh, CPAC, and uh, uh, you had 51 more agreements signed. So, how do they interpret this relationship? For Pakistan, China is a high payoff security guarantor. And for China, Pakistan is a low cost uh, secondary deterrence against uh, India. That's right. And that is how that relationship has evolved and now they have a very romanticized um, way of calling it, you know, higher than mountain, deeper, deeper than Deeper than ocean, Indian ocean, sweeter than honey. <laughs> tougher than steel and yeah. a new epithet has come up mm -hmm. and that is called Bata. That is the iron brother. brother yeah. And this has got further cemented post CPAC. And subsequently, with the abrogation of Article 370, when the geographical boundaries were redrawn by India and we started reclaiming Aksai Chin and subsequently, you know, certain statements about Gilgit Baltistan. With that, China de facto emerged as a third party. And therefore, even though earlier there were certain indirect dimension to this, but now the military dimension has become far more prominent. And in that, I would like to flag four critical elements of this strategic relationship. One is the very strategic, in which there are two very important factors. One is the Karakram Highway, which is called the juggler van of the CPAC. And it has its own security implications in terms of build up, you know, joint uh, deployment. Uh, faster uh, supply of military hardware, even deploying certain missiles in about 100 odd tunnels. And second is Gwadar port. Now, Gwadar is a strategic outpost where the continental prong and the maritime prong of the Belt and Road Initiative, they converge. And they, Chinese are in the process of dredging the port. Presently, its depth, depth is about 12.5 meters. They may increase it to about 17.5 meters for the container trade. And subsequently, if they increase the depth of water to 24.5 meters, then even it can be made suitable for submarine 
operation, stealth operation. And then there are economic dimensions, I will not get into that. And the political uh, diplomatic dimension where um, Pakistan woes by one China policy and uh, China comes to their rescue, be it, uh, you know, UN resolution 1267 at the FATF or very recently they made three feeble attempts, you know, on the Kashmir issue to, to be side introduced in Pakistan. the UN. Yeah. But the recent developments that have uh, unfolded at the line of actual control and the concurrent deployment of Pakistan's two odd division. Now this earlier, even if there was an iota of doubt whether this two front nexus will manifest in a military kind of a scenario, I think that issue is settled. And today India is seriously beset with a two front scenario given our relations with Pakistan and China. So I think it's become a reality and we'll have to find ways and means to deal with it in a very effective manner. Sure. I'll come back to that uh, question. But General Katoch, uh, Pakistan uh, by comparison bilaterally with India is uh, a weaker uh, state, nation state uh, by military means or by its economic uh, state of affairs that it is going through. Yeah. And yet uh, it has uh, an important role to play against India because of the China factor as General Sharma mentioned. Hmm. What are the military aspects of uh, Pakistan's strategy against India uh, with uh, China or in collaboration with China that you are looking at? Okay. Uh, you know, there is a very old dictum, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, this nexus between China and Pakistan, the very basis of that is that and uh, that is but natural. That is but natural. Otherwise, of course, uh, if you look at the systems of the government, you know, and Islamic State and a communist state, logically they should not be getting together. Uh, and maybe uh, in the hearts of the people of Pakistan, uh, they may feel some differences with the Chinese. But because of the enemy of my enemy uh, factor, they have got together. And uh, this particular, uh, you know, one should not be doing bean counting. Right. Uh, but uh, it is okay to do some bean counting to get a little idea that say Pakistan has got a total of about 9 cores, right? And sure. we got a total of 14 cores out of which about 4 you can say are not aligned uh, to the, uh, you know, to the western border. Right. So, uh, Pakistan just if it is, uh, you know, if it is matched alone with India and we are, I am talking cores in terms of army, if you bring in the navy, you bring in the air force, we have uh, superior uh, by a degree. To offset their superiority, you always need somebody else, a stronger person to help you. It could be a, uh, you know, it may not be a superpower, but a strong enough person to help you. So, if the Chinese are able to even come in physically, which they may not, uh, for a variety of reasons, but even their moral support, material support is enough to enable them to manage on their own and of course we are not talking of the nuclear factor because uh, you know once you get into the nuclear dom domain uh, that's a particular weapon which helps a weaker country to always be able to stand up but then one doesn't jump to nuclear straight away so in a conventional sphere uh, they are uh, you know there is a requirement to have alliances there is a requirement to have pacts and uh, the subtle difference between pacts and alliances that in a pact you are giving in writing that I'll come to your aid now, between the Chinese and the Pakistanis, uh, there is not really a pact, there is an agreement of peace, friendship, cooperation. Sure. But in the small print, uh, the print in that Fine says, print is like, yeah, yeah, it says yeah. that it, in case uh, uh, you will not, uh, you know, we will come to each other's help, we will consult each other right. if something happens and you will not sign a similar agreement with somebody else. So, willy-nilly it means that we will come to your, to your aid, aid materially, if not Physically. Right. And physically would happen only under certain circumstances. Right. So, uh, General Sharma, in fact, you spoke about uh, various dimensions of this uh, nexus. The Indian strategic planners, military leadership uh, has been speaking about this possibility for almost, uh, if not uh, 30 years, 20 years at least. Uh, and of course, we saw in the 65 war, uh, there was some movement, uh, China made some threatening noises, 71 
uh, some say that the uh, December uh, uh, so timeline was chosen so that the passes are closed and the Chinese cannot intervene. All those factors were there. But the Chinese never overtly actually backed Pakistan or came to their aid as General Katoj was saying. They never came physically. But the scenario has completely changed now. So what should be the uh, strategy of the uh, Indian uh, establishment, uh, security establishment to deal with this uh, reality now? Uh, the way we are facing um, uh, the threat from uh, both sides, uh, what should the Indian planners do? The first and foremost thing is, we have to settle this question in our own minds and that too between the political authority and the military authority, what our threat perception is. Before this threat manifested in this particular manner, there were people in the establishment Oh, who said, well, we will never have a two-front scenario and we'll ne never have a war with China and things like that. But now that has become a reality. And therefore, we need to analyze the entire spectrum of conflict up the escalation ladder. And at the lower end, what we have is the non-contact, non-kinetic domain. Then we have non-contact kinetic domain, then you come into the conventional domain which could be sectoral or which could even be one front, two fronts, two and a half fronts and then after that you have a nuclear environment because all three are nuclear parts. So it's extremely important for Indian military planners and strategic security planners to look at the whole range of scenarios. What is the probability of each scenario? Cost, benefit, risk, outcomes, and how should we have a responsive mechanism to deal with these scenarios? But getting on to the present context, I feel there could be four possible scenarios that we have to deal with in the near term. Mm -hmm. First is that uh, given Pakistan's internal dynamics, that its economy is fragile, politically it, there is a lot of turmoil, mm -hmm. uh, the sword of FATF is hanging, its diplomatic relations with the Arab world has actually become a very big problem mm -hmm. and has not been able to find this new alliance with Iran and Turkey. So it's on the horns of dilemma. Right. And uh, military capability doesn't exist to the level that it they, they should have. So one option for them is that permit China to do the heavy lifting. Uh, weight lifting. <laughs> and you yeah. keep, uh, you know, adjusting the temperatures by resorting to rhetoric and certain infiltration, you know, the routine traditional infiltration across the uh, line of control. Right. The second scenario could be, that you up then, you look that this is an opportune moment for me and you trigger or you engineer some kind of uh, Palwama Uri kind of sensational strikes and put Indian establishment on the horns of dilemma. If you respond, then you say India has false flagged these operations and it is India which is the better of aggression and India, the onus of opening the second front would lie on India. And then they would respond. And Chinese are always there. The third scenario that I visualize and we have to look at seriously, that at the moment we are in some kind of a stalemate with Chinese. But should India decide that if Chinese are not restoring uh, the status quo ante and we take certain options, quid pro quo options, and Chinese come under pressure because Chinese know they will not be able to prevail upon him given our mirror deployment then they can wink at Pakistan and Pakistan can start doing certain nibbling actions either in northern Ladakh or somewhere in Kashmir Valley, you know, to sort of distract us and to divert our attentions. And should the things get escalated now, mm -hmm. the Chinese don't back out, we don't back out and the conflict opens to other sectors also. Right then probably Pakistan may be tempted by China because Chinese will not accept a defeat. Even a status quo is a very serious embarrassment. That's right. In that case, we should be looking at the worst case scenario, mm. wherein China, at least in Kashmir Valley, opens another front 
and we have to deal with the Chinese in Ladakh mm -hmm. and that is a worst case scenario. So for all these scenarios, our planning and responses will have to be worked out and not to deal with in a knee jerk, in a reactive Or in a, in a ad hoc manner. An ad hoc in a reactive right. manner. No, no, I get your uh, thing completely because uh, that's something now it's become a reality. This nightmare uh, scenario, if you want to call that, if you are a pessimist, you will look at it as a nightmare scenario. But General Katoch, uh, you were also in uh, PP, yeah. if I remember correctly, you yes. were DG uh, perspective planning. Uh, you know, clearly uh, this threat has not come uh, or manifested itself overnight. This has been there at the back of our mind. Uh, in fact, a former chief had spoken about the two-front scenario under a nuclear overhang, yes. if you remember, almost 13-14 yeah, yeah. uh, years ago. So, not that uh, the Indian uh, military establishment is not prepared for it. But how do you see uh, if uh, this uh, scenario comes through, where earlier people used to say, if Pakistan opens a front, China will not like to intervene militarily. But today, that possibility has uh, been negated, most probably. So there, what should we be doing? What should India be doing? I mean, I know General Sharma has spoken about a couple of things, but what is your view? Uh, how do you uh, send signals to pa Pakistan uh, that, you know, it's not in your uh, uh, interest to open up another front? What, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, we've been talking about the two-front uh, war uh, for fairly long now. And sometimes we start talking, of, uh, uh, not start talking, we do talk about two-and-a-half front also. Yeah. But let's forget the half front because half front is, uh, you know, the danger that you feel may come to your rear areas. And I think we've got very capable uh, central armed police forces if we leave it to them and use our military for a two front scenario. Uh, in my personal view, we are uh, strong enough uh, to be able to, you know, cope with that. But when you talk of a two front scenario, it does not mean that you will equally address both, both. the fronts. Right. So, you have to, uh, depending on where the, uh, who has initiated the war, uh, you have to deal with one party first and then uh, tackle the other. Right. And uh, say uh, a hypothetical situation that in case uh, the war is with China and uh, it is more likely in such a situation, it is more likely that uh, Pakistan may try to do either, like we said, sectorally or maybe all along. Uh, you know, military action, then we have to decide that I'm sure there are plans for that, that whom do we hold and whom do, do we, we attack? <laughs> uh, yeah, whom do we attack? So, uh, uh, there would be plans for that. Now, that all depends. I mean, it's very uh, difficult to legislate uh, right. what should be done. But uh, let me tell you one thing that say we do have the capability to hold the uh, uh, the Western Front very, very easily mm. and use forces from the Western Front on the Northern Front. The dual task yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, forces yeah. that are there. Yeah. You see, all uh, the codes that we have, mm. uh, the holding codes that we have on the, we yes. call them the pivot codes sometimes, but yes. basically holding uh, codes. Holding <laughs> codes. <laughs> right. The holding codes we have there, and I commanded one of them. Yes. Uh, the holding codes that we have there are more than sufficient to hold any attack and Suppose we have no designs to go inside Pakistan, they can hold any number of attack and we have still sufficient forces right. which can be diverted to the, to the other and, front. And on the other front, the requirement is more of infantry and artillery. Sure. Right. So, mountains, it is not armor. Mountains follow up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, we have troops. got more than adequate armor on the western front which right. is more than adequate to hold uh, mm. any threat from there. So, we can, you know, tackle one and uh, then meet the other. And obviously, this is not a situation that one would like to, uh, you know, uh, it is an avoidable situation. Yes. So, therefore, I mean, the I mean, it's the worst case scenario. It is the worst case scenario. But, but that's it is avoidable. Uh, good but to know that, yes, you know, there yes. are enough uh, reserves yes. and uh, plans. And I, uh, here, I am talking only in terms of the army. Mil army. Yeah. army right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, mm. so is the Air Force. And yes. Navy, we have great preponderance. Yeah. Absolutely. As against Pakistan, against, definitely. And, definitely. Uh, and China, of course, is yes. far away from yes. the Indian Ocean. Uh, we don't, we so. don't really expect that they will come in strength. Yeah. And uh, mm. should that happen, uh, well, some amount of alliances, uh, whether uh, implied or actual, are required. After right. all, in 71 war, we did go in for... Uh, with the Russians. With the, Russian. with the, with the Soviet Union in. that time. But uh, uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, yeah. And mm. in such uh, things, you know, even like 
three B2 bombers, uh, you know, coming to Daigo Garcia just three days back. Is, <laughs> yeah. it's, is, a it's a signal. It is a signal. It's a signal. Yeah. But that's that's what brings me to uh, my uh, you know uh, critical question about India's uh, possible friends or who will come to uh, India's support if not uh, rescue. India doesn't need anybody to rescue uh, uh, at the current scenario. But who will support? Will the US uh, and uh, Japan, for instance, come to India's uh, support uh, if uh, such a scenario happens, if the balloon goes up? See, today's situation, geopolitical situation is very different than what it was a decade ago. Today, China has antagonized everybody. Everybody. And uh, look at the state of relations between US and China. They are virtually in a war, whether it's technological trade war and the kind of face-offs which are taking place in South China Sea in the Western Pacific. And same is the state with Japanese. And during Doklam crisis, Japanese came on board and they supported our stand there. Likewise, both the countries are on board and they've said that it is a China which is an aggressor. This coupled with certain other statements with the US has made and uh, the three aircraft carrier which they mobilize in South China Sea and the, the joint exercises, you know, with the Indian Navy. The PASEX that this they This was did, part yes. of signaling. Sure. And now these uh, B-2 bombers which have come there, uh, if you look at the statement made by the spokesperson of the Pentagon, right. it was very clear signaling. We do not want anybody to get physically embroiled in fighting on the Indian side. Right. As long as they can keep China pinned down and they are not able to shift their those out of four theater commands which are on the other frontiers right. and divert their air force resources sure. and other things onto Indian border, then I think we would have carried the day. If we have to only deal with the Western theater command mm. which is in, say, which is in Chengdu, then we are good enough as long as they are not able to master other resources. To this way, to maintain, to imbalance, strategically imbalance China and keep them fixated on the other front, both Japan and US can play a role mm -hmm. besides giving us the high and uh, force multiplier and other, uh, other Weapons, equipment, military air yeah. arsenal which we very badly required. Now, this is the level of uh, this support. That and likewise, I feel that if US tells Pakistan is that if you open the second front, then I will Switch make the a tap. specimen out of you. <laughs> you know what, the earlier that we will bomb you to the, the stone, stone age. age. <laughs> so that kind of a statement if US issues, I don't think Pakistan will have any guts to open the city. That's right. Richard Amitai just said yeah, that, uh, that yeah. I'll bomb you to, we will bomb you to the Stone, Stone Age. Age. But uh, General Katoch, one final question to you before I close this uh, program. Um, the Chinese, uh, of course, are supporting Pakistan in many different ways. Uh, they are the uh, most uh, preferred military suppliers, although Pakistanis have a lot of uh, American uh, hardware too. Uh, but uh, given the fact that Pakistan is so vulnerable on many other fronts, economic, uh, terrorism uh, and like General Sharma said that uh, uh, US can just switch off the tap or uh, up the ante in the UN uh, about FATF. Uh, do you think uh, that kind of uh, non-military measures are also required against both China and Pakistan from Indian and Indian friends? Uh, well, definitely non-military measures are required and uh, you know going back to uh, the point uh, that you just discussed earlier about Japan, Australia and all that uh, the the, prom the the importance for the Quad is the promise that it holds. Right. And, uh, you know, the four countries of the Quad are the four, they are four democracies and each of them individually uh, has got the economic and the military strength to say no to China. So that is important, so the, that promise is important. Uh, it, it is up to China. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it wants this grouping to become more solid, right? So, uh, it also has to calibrate its actions. If it, uh, you know, just goes uh, without thinking, he will ensure that this alliance becomes uh, more it, solid. It gets cemented, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now the second part that you asked, uh, yes, it, it, ne it needs, uh, you know, uh, you know, Pakistan uh, indulges in hybrid war against India. Right. Hybrid war means 
uh, every mean is used. So it does need uh, a whole of country approach. Right. And uh, I think earlier we were talking about uh, you know the country being the the people of the country being involved in uh, the defense of the country. Uh, in a, in a situation of a hybrid sort of war where Pakistan tries to undermine us by uh, you know sowing dissension uh, by other such means, if the people are aware about it. Uh, they can, uh, you know, take, take countermeasures. Yeah. And of course, we know that uh, as far as the cyber uh, world is concerned, Pakistan is no, it's very limited uh, capability. But China has capability. Yeah. It it has got a institutionalized sort of capability, and that is where, in a sort of nexus, uh, by not overtly coming to the aid of uh, Pakistan, uh, China can uh, you know indulge in all, all these means when we talk of collusive support collusive is a little derogatory word it means that you know you are trying to in a very mean sort of way you are doing something so it can it can do that mean sort of thing uh, but these things uh, don't really have a great effect mm -hmm. uh, like uh, i believe that deterrence is effective on a country only if its people are scared right right and mm -hmm. Cyber attacks and such things might, uh, you know, disrupt your economy, might dis uh, dis uh, disrupt the communications, sure. military or civilian, but it doesn't scare the people. Right. It doesn't scare it the people. It can be overcome. Yeah, it can be overcome. Can be overcome. It can be overcome. Yeah. So, any help from anybody to counter that uh, is obviously very welcome. Great. So, so, the sum total of our discussion actually uh, tells me that uh, India need not be uh, unduly alarmed about the uh, two-front yes, uh, scenario. It's a nightmare scenario, the worst case scenario, but uh, given the kind of uh, uh, capability we have developed over the years and maybe that needs to be strengthened from time to time and uh, create alliances with the like-minded uh, democracies that we are already doing in form of Quad or even uh, in the neighborhood, I think uh, there should be no undue alarm. Uh, of course, we have to be on our guard is what uh, comes out of this discussion. Uh, once again, uh, excellent insight uh, by the uh, two experts uh, from USI. Uh, so therefore, uh, do keep watching uh, Strategic Insight. Uh, we will have uh, a couple of more episodes coming up. And uh, of course, uh, continue with this uh, whenever uh, such uh, requirements come up. So uh, until the next time, uh, do remember to keep watching us, uh, like us on our social media platforms, uh, keep sending feedback and comments and we will take them up as and when. Uh, these uh, issues uh, manifest themselves uh, for such discussions. Until the next time.